Good morning. This is Chris Jones of the University of Arizona, Gila County Cooperative Extension. Welcome to this week's edition of the Garden and Country Extension webinar series. Today, we're gonna to be talking about Project Harvest and its summary and major findings concerning harvested rainwater and quality, harvested rainwater quality. We have the uh, project investigator, Monica Ramirez Andriotto with us and uh, community health worker coordinator, Miriam Jones. Just a little bit about these webinars. Um, they are a weekly Zoom webinar. They're 60 minutes or less, Thursdays at 11 in Arizona. They feature a variety of horticultural and natural resources topics relevant to the environmental conditions and residential concerns of Gila County and those beyond throughout the state um, as the topics of interest. A recording will be posted at the extension.arizona.edu slash Gila website. So this is the University of Arizona Gila County um, website. I get these all posted. And the University of Arizona is an equal opportunity affirmative action institution. And with that cue, I'm going to open up an anonymous poll for our uh, launch poll. And this here is just information that we need to um, report. And so please take a moment there to indicate your age and gender and ethnic information. I'll leave that up while I go through these slides here and, and close that. Again, it's, it's anonymous. Um, back to my slides. Here we are today, today's agenda. Um, thank you for those of you who are able to join us early for our login and little lag time. At 11 o'clock, I started with our welcome. I'm Chris Jones, your moderator. Our topic today is Project Harvest, Summary and Major Findings Concerning Harvested Rainwater Quality with Monica Ramirez Andriota and Miriam Jones. They have about a half hour presentation for us. Um, we will open it up for a Q&A, question and answer discussion with Monica and Miriam, and we will wrap up um, at or before noon and in the call. Um, Please ask, put your questions into the, either the chat box, the Q&A, and I'll help uh, to share that with, with Monica and Miriam. Here are our presenters for today. Monica is a Master of Public Administration and PhD Assistant Professor, uh, maybe Associate Professor, let us know, Monica, at the Department of Environmental Sciences at the University of Arizona. And Miriam Jones is a community health worker, again, with the Department of Environmental Science and at the University of Arizona. And with that, I'm going to stop these slides and invite Monica to uh, unmute and, and take the stage. Welcome. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, it's an honor to be here today and I'm excited to engage each and every one of you to see the attendee list at around 38. So this is outstanding. All right, let us get started here. I will um, share my screen. So Chris, can you see the screen successfully? Yes, I believe we're in good shape and I can hear you very well. Awesome. All right. Well, again, my name is Monica and luckily I am an associate professor. Happy to report that I found out in May of 2021 that I was uh, promoted to tenure, uh, to associate with tenure. So thank you all for your contributions to Project Harvest and support within the communities in which we work. I'm also uh, delighted and honored to be working with Miriam Jones, who is the community health educator in the Globe Miami area, who will be uh, uh, presenting along my side. So let's just uh, get started here. Uh, we do wanna begin with a land acknowledgement. So we respectfully acknowledge that the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes with Tucson being home to the Sono Otom and the Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the University of Arizona strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign Native nations and Indigenous communities through education offerings, partnerships, and community service. All right, let's jump right in. Okay, so my laboratory and this project is motivated to achieve environmental justice. And when we're motivated to achieve justice, we want to see structural change. And so here you see in this box is a definition of structural change looking at determinants of these meso-level determinants of health, right? And here's some examples. 
And so with that, we are excited to say to be intentional and consider co-created environmental health citizen science or uh, co-created community science efforts. And the way in which we're going to go about and frame this whole project that you're here today is we're going to acknowledge the steps in which community researchers contributed to the research projects uh, that will be presented today. So here are nine steps and we'll be uh, showing these, the community uh, level engagement throughout all. Another thing is to give a shout out to Creative Reaction Lab, which has proposed equity centered community design in light of the uh, Black Lives Matter movement and other things to be considering when moving towards equity. And so I wanna highlight Creative Reaction Lab's equity-centered community design here, because we also see similarities in this co-created nature, equity-centered nature, as well as community science. So I just, this is a shout out to this effort as well. So this is, this is a massive team of individuals. There is no way to do this level of research uh, without uh, collaboration across disciplines. And so the top row you see are the promotoras that are the community health workers that are part of Project Harvest. And then within here, you'll see the students as well as other investigators and research team members who have been part of this process. So massive shout out to everyone here and acknowledging that it takes a village to do this type of transdisciplinary environmental health science research with a co-design process. Here is the question for study, right? So community, uh, in the past, I administered community needs assessments. I have or participate on or lead community advisory boards and we have ongoing interactions with local community members. And one thing that was crystal clear is that families are harvesting rainwater to conserve water, reduce heat island effect, increase green space, have a good water source. Sorry, my dog is getting water just returned from a long walk uh, to irrigate gardens and reduce heat island effect, which I stated twice to emphasize the role of gr uh, green canopy in communities. And so what something that came about is the question from community members who were gardening, right, addressing this uh, addressing access to foods by having home gardens and or they were harvesting rainwater to conserve water and be an environmental steward. And one question that came up across communities is, are there pollutants in harvesting rainwater? Can I use the harvested rainwater for my garden? And so with that, we uh, decided, we built the research questions around that, right? So we looked at the quality of harvesting rainwater. We collected field blanks uh, within the field, or I should say community members collected the harvested rainwater sample as well as the field blank. We also collected soils that were irrigated with harvested rainwater, soils that were not irrigated with harvested rainwater, and we looked at plants that were irrigated with harvested rainwater. And all of this, oops, the little poles showed up, and all of this, uh, within these media, different environmental media, we looked at metals like arsenic and heavy metals, pesticides, industrial compounds, and microbial indicators. And so here are actually some images that have been sent in by participants of Project Harvest. And some of you, uh, if there are any participants on the line, you might recognize your uh, location. And so uh, a big step with the Project Harvest is uh, uh, you know, working alongside and uh, working with promotoras or people who share similar social backgrounds or life experiences who are the liaisons and knowledge brokers uh, between the University of Arizona and the communities in which we're engaging. <clears throat> and it's at this point that I'm going to pass it to Miriam to describe uh, their experience as a community health worker in your community. And so let me get those slides up. Thank you, Monica. Of course. All right, here we go. Oops. I don't see the slides. There you yeah. go. Uh, yeah. Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is Miriam Jones, and I'm the promotora of the Globe Miami area. That's me. And I'm wearing the same shirt today. Next. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how, how did I become involved with this program? In 2017, uh, there was a whole week of education that was brought to us by Monica's team from the University of Arizona, from the Sonora Environmental Research Institute in Tucson. So we learned a lot about climate change, uh, harvesting rainwater, the team of scientists that, that just develop all these uh, sampling methods uh, and experiments came here and taught us a little bit about chemistry and 
organic and inorganic compounds. So um, I was very interested in the project and we all, all the participants receive an invitation to apply for the job and I was a lucky one. Next one, please. Uh, so uh, who, no, no. Um, Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so um, how many citizen scientists participated in Glow Miami area? We had 22 participants and 24 sites. One of the sites was the Globe High School. And through this program, they receive a cistern that allowed them to start harvesting rainwater. Um, we had 18 sites in Globe and six sites in Miami. And um, you can see that people, we were asking people to do it according to their own possibilities. So we didn't ask them to buy something new, but they sample soils in pots or in their own gardens and use whatever they had in hand or bought rain, water, rain barrels to do that. Next one, please. And um, we recruited the volunteers through that workshop, also through referrals. And we had 11 people uh, of the 22 participants, 11 were males and 11 were females, eight individuals were retired, one person was a high school student and 13 participants were working full time. And this is so important to be grateful to them. Next one, because uh, uh, it required a significant amount of hours during the years and during three years. So I had very good experience getting to know the people interested in the program. Um, it was important for me that I was a liaison to university team. And so whatever comments the participants had here in my community or questions, I will refer them to the team. And so that's how there was always information coming back and forth from both parts. Next one, please. Uh, some of the obstacles that I had is that even though there were many people interested in the program, uh, some people didn't have enough time to do it. Um, some people felt insecure or had frustrations involved with learning something new and also the time of the project. But I was so happy to say that we kept the interest of the participants during the three years. I'm very grateful. So being part of this uh, scientific research that involved multiple communities in Arizona. And um, I'm very happy because uh, now we get to see the results. Thank you, Monica. All right, thank you so much, Miriam. And just know that we will uh, both be here throughout the rest of the presentation to answer any questions. And so that perspective is critical in this presentation and in this work because none of this would have been possible without the engagement with community and the role of the promotoras across all communities. And so in the beginning, our research team, right, would consider myself, Aminata Kimongo, uh, Leif Abril, Jean McLean, and Rob Root. We went through and looked at based on community location, based on previous engagements that I had had throughout the community, along with the Sonoran Environmental Research Institute in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, we conducted a, a literature review and analysis of existing data sets. And so the contaminants below were selected. And so I do wanna highlight that we did a laboratory and a do-it-yourself methodology. And so where you see the asterisk is where we did um, the um, analysis for uh, do-it-yourself. One, oops, let me go back. Okay, one thing to acknowledge too is the Project Harvest participants and intersectionalities. And so this is an understanding that our project has cut across different socioeconomic variables that are critical to acknowledge and uh, sheds light on how critical it is to have inclusion efforts in community projects. 51% are of our participants identified or refer limited or low income households. 55% did not have a college degree. 50% self-identified as a person of color with the majority being Latino, Latinx, or Hispanic. 
and 25% uh, speak Spanish as their dominant language. And what's also critical is that 47% of the participants were from rural communities. And when we look at these communities, who were they and what, uh, they were Dewey Humboldt, right, which we see here has home to the Iron King Mine and Humboldt Smelter Superfund site. We have Hayden Winkleman, which has the Asarco Alternative Superfund site in an active smelter or intermittently active smelter, Globe Miami, as well as Tucson, which has nine state, federal, uh, either state, federal, or Department of Defense cleanup sites. And what I want to highlight is that we have uh, the partnerships had been built within these communities. So the years that you see above the, uh, by the raindrop indicates the longevity in which I had been working in these communities to establish these types of partnerships to do this type of integrated science and research and engagement. And you also see the number of participants listed below. Just highlighting again that we have this very nice uh, divide of almost half uh, rural, half urban. This allows us to do some interesting data analysis. And then here again is showing the percentage of participants by community. So what we're very excited to talk about is the uh, community sampling. So here are just different images of that type of sampling and what went on. This is the uh, images of the do-it-yourself methodology. What happened here is that we had um, as part of learning research, which is something I will not be talking about today, but can uh, definitely talk about in the future if you'd like. We wanted to see how participants felt and their sense of learning and action and uh, participation in the scientific process might have varied or be influenced by the sampling kit. So some participants were given the randomly divided, were given a do-it-yourself kit, and the other half were given a laboratory kit. And then in year two, they switched. And then in year three, we had people choose which kit they want to do. Some participants wanted both kits and did both. And in some cases, we just assigned the kit to individuals. Give you a little sense of what that looked like. So lab would be community members collecting samples, sending them into the University of Arizona laboratories. And do it yourself is where participants had all the materials to run the experiment on their own at their home and get that data set within a, an hour for the inorganic arsenic or within a week for the sulfur reducing bacteria, which would be an indicator of micro, uh, uh, can, um, a microbial indicator. Uh, what I want, oops, there's some animation there. Okay, moving right along. So we, just to give you a sense of the time frame, we started this project in 2017 and wrapped up in 2021. And excuse, yeah, so this is a little interest. Sorry, just looking at these years. This is a. And so what we did is we bracketed the two major precipitation periods in the Southwest. So the beginning and end of North American summer monsoon and winter rains. And these time frames were based on historical uh, precipitation data from the National Weather Service. And so we ran from 2017 to 2018, 2018 to 2019, 2019 to 2020. And Yes, this is correct. And unfortunately, we had to cancel our monsoon sampling due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so love and support going out to every, every single one of us who have been working through that or have might have had a loved one affected by COVID-19. We also administered, in addition to the learning research surveys and instruments that were administered by the promotoras, we had a home description survey. This was around 145 questions that participants completed. And we did this to tease out and understand if any, to understand the home and roof, the harvesting rainwater infrastructure, uh, perceptions about pollution, gardening activities, and potential routes of, of contamination that could, that could influence the, the data set that we have today. And so I'll be sprinkling through these, some of these questions throughout our data sharing experience. As stated, like learning research is, efforts were critical to this work, so we were looking to see if this level of engagement and co-creation led to any increases in environmental health literacy, and this is just a, a teaser that we would talk, could talk about this at another time. All right, so for today, we're going to talk about total coliform and E. coli, arsenic and lead, as well as the pesticides and inorganic compounds. We won't be going into the nitty gritty of each and every one of these, but you'll get to see, you'll see the data set um, and divided by pesticide industrial compounds. We also have more details available here on our website, which I will uh, be sure to show at the end. All right, so jumping right into inorganic, 
these would be the uh, arsenic and heavy metals or metalloids. Uh, shout out to Jesus Solis Leon and Kunal Palawat, the students who worked uh, very, uh, had hard work and worked on these data sets, as well as uh, recognizing the teams associated with this contaminant suite. So for today, we'll talk about arsenic, which is something that naturally exists in the Earth's crust. Uh, it's due to the geology in parts of Arizona and around the world, we have naturally occurring arsenic in groundwater, which is why it's so critical to, uh, if you have a private well, to be monitoring the quality of your private well water. Uh, but we do know that arsenic can be released by human activity into the environment by mining or smelting or other industrial uses. And unfortunately, arsenic exposure is uh, linked to cancer of different organs. You see some listed here, but also associated with non-cancer outcomes as well, such as uh, cardiovascular disease. And here we also we talk about lead, which is also naturally occurring in the Earth's crust. But can, but has been um, due to human activity. We also find lead in paints and batteries. Uh, it was also used as a solder used to connect copper pipes, which is why we are, are need to be uh, diligent with testing our water. Um, and it was used as a gasoline additive, and fortunately banned and eliminated by 19, banned in 1973, and then eliminated in 1996. And we are worried and care very much about lead exposure because there is no safe limit. There is no safe limit of exposure to lead in our environment, especially for children. And so the data shows us that lead can seriously harm a child's health, hurt the brain and nervous system, and has been linked to attention deficit disorders, lowering of IQ, as well as uh, other neurological challenges. In this data set, I will be uni using the units micrograms per liter. And so micrograms per liter refers to Exactly that, but that might be hard to visualize, right? So for comparison, micrograms per liter would be one part, one microgram per liter would be one part per billion, or, right, it's equivalent to a drop of ink in a 15,000 gallon backyard swimming pool. So we're talking low concentrations here, but these are values that are used in the standards set up in our society to protect us. Or sorry, standards use this unit as well. So if we were to talk about regulatory standards, those of you who are Project Harvest participants, you know this very well. We compared, based on how you use that rainwater, harvested rainwater, we compared those concentrations to various United States, federal and Arizona state standards. What we uh, observed is that the majority of participants are using harvested rainwater for watering gardens, which will, uh, or irrigation. And so when we had a high level of exceedance, like really high or in terms of how that participant was using the rainwater, we reached out and had one-on-one -on -one engagement and follow-up with those households. And so for today, you'll see that these are the standards that were used. And that again, the majority of participants were using it for uh, watering gardens. And so we paid particularly large amounts of time or, or participants pay a particular amount of attention to the irrigation standard when interpreting their data set. And so this, uh, you know, shout out, big shout out to student Kunal Palawat, who's on the call today for the, uh, the slide generation, and we'll give a shout out to when you can attend uh, their defense coming up, and I'll do that at the end of today. So here is looking at the contaminant that standard that are the contaminant in the community. So here's Globe Miami. This is showing how many samples were received over the project. And now what I'm gonna do is highlight the values, right? So this is the standard for these different um, uses of water. And what you can see here is that out of the 124 samples received that we did not have, um, when we look at how they compared to the drinking water, livestock and poultry, full body contact, partial and irrigation, we did not have any exceedances from this area. When we look at lead, we did see exceedances for drinking, surface, uh, full body contact, as well as partial body contact. But again, the majority of people are using it for irrigation. So in summary, right, in the whole entire project, not just specific to Globe Miami, we only had one exceedance of the irrigation um, agricultural standard for arsenic, and none exceeded the agricultural irrigation standard for lead. But now let's go into the data set. So what I just did is gave you this overview of how these values compare to regulatory standards based on how you might be using the harvested rainwater. What I wanted to, I do want to caveat that those standards are designed to inform decision-making and are typically uh, risk-based. So for example, that, or 
but but in comparison, the irrigation standard is very much uh, talking about how that metal would accumulate in the soils to then cause damage to the plant and soil fertility. And so it's important to understand the application and definition of each standard, which is on our website if you wanna get uh, more information about. I do wanna highlight that using those standards are to inform our usage, but they should not promote complacency, meaning that we should really consider if, it, that if and when, we should really consider what it means to find contamination in rainwater. So one thing we did is we looked at how does the rainwater, right, harvested rainwater collected, right, that would hit a rooftop, that would go into a gutter, that would then be collected in a cistern and, and that water would accumulate over time. How does that harvested rainwater compare to what we're calling sky water, right, or loop sky water here, this water that does not touch any cistern at all, just goes straight from the sky into a collection device. And luckily Kunal was able to identify an image of what these collection devices look like. And so what you see here is in orange are the communities that participated in Project Harvest and the purple are representing the sky water sampling sites. And so now what you're going to see is the, uh, all, the, the, all three years of data put together. You're going to see the mean representation by the bar and then standard deviation represented by the whisker box or the line with the brackets. And what we see here is this is a representation of 577 samples collected across the Project Harvest, or collected in Project Harvest, and then around 78 samples that are, uh, were collected between 2017 and 2020, representing the purple or sky water here. What I, we want to highlight is that all communities have significantly greater values in sky water meaning that these community values were at a statistically significant greater value than the sky water value. We also want to acknowledge oops, that Tucson, Dewey Humboldt, and Glow Miami are significantly lower than Hayden Winkleman, meaning that Hayden Winkleman had a significantly greater arsenic concentration in their harvested rainwater. This was, that was for all for arsenic. Now let's look at lead. Again, the same style, we're comparing the sky water to the Project Harvest community. What we see here is Tucson and Hayden Winkleman have greater values than the sky water and are significantly greater than Dewey Humble. However, when Kunal did additional, so Kunal ran models and did the statistical analysis here, saw that based, it was significant based on the model, but when we double checked it with a, a more aggressive, another tool, it was not significant after that. So initially it was significant, but later on it wasn't. So we're highlighting this, that it's of important to note, but it wasn't significant after we did the post hoc test. So what we, the takeaway I would say from this is there is an, um, anthropogenic influence on arsenic concentrations in harvest and rainwater in all communities, and on lead potentially in Tucson and Hayden Winkleman. Another thing, additional level of scrutiny that was done with the data set, and this is looking at specifically the Globe Miami area and looking at arsenic concentrations, is that we directed Kunal and asked Kunal to assess whether the uh, proximity to the mining activity would influence harvested rainwater concentrations of arsenic. And so what Kunal did is like identify this boundary identified the locations in which these different jurisdictions in which we receive samples, and then looked at the geometric mean of arsenic concentration by location. What you see here is that Miami was significantly greater than the um, District 5, uh, the Central Heights, uh, Six Shooter Canyon, uh, um, and Six Shooter Canyon, and that Claypool was significantly greater than Six Shooter Canyon. And so we did see some interesting differences by the specific community locations and designations. If we look at lead using the same idea, looking at proximity or uh, sorry, looking at community and proximity to the mining activity, we see here that Miami is significantly greater than District Two, uh, so District Two, Central Heights, as well as um, Ice, uh, Ice House Canyon and six shooter. But another way to look at this data is to do what we call these scatter plots. And so the A, what you see in A is the arsenic concentrations and B is the uh, lead concentrations. And these are basically plotted, a scatter plot of plotting these concentrations 
from and distance from the mining site. And so this allows us to look at how, um, whether distance makes a difference. And the results are averaged over the values for the sampling season. And what we do see is that arsenic significantly decreases with every kilometer increase in distance. And we also see that lead significantly decreases. And so what we're trying to say here is that the further away you are from the mining location, we did see reduction in the arsenic and lead concentration at a statistically significant level. So the take home is that there is a relationship between distance and location from the mine and the arsenic and lead concentration. The next thing that uh, in terms of connecting the data set to the rainwater, harvested rainwater uh, infrastructure is asking whether infrastructure such as the home or the harvested rainwater uh, cistern itself or gutter or something or roof influences the arsenic and lead concentration. And so here are some images to contextualize what we were looking at. And so what Kunal did is took, again, uh, participants on the phone might remember these questions. And so well, we did, looking at these questions, we then looked at whether they were significant, what, meaning whether this question, the way that a participant responded, influenced the modeling and the concentrations of arsenic and lead. And what we see here is that the home was significant as well, and for lead, the age of the cistern was significant. And so when we control, right, so I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty of the statistics, you can go to Kunal's defense to hear that. But when you control for community and time, for community and time of year, older homes are associated with more arsenic and lead in rainwater, and older cisterns had uh, more lead in the rainwater than younger ones. And so we want to highlight here that though we found that these two variables uh, were significant, they were these individual choices about infrastructure do not influence contamination as greatly as the time of the year, seasonality, and community. So in summary, right, we did see that for lead and arsenic, harvesting rainwater samples are safe for gardening at this point in time. Concentrations do not significantly vary by most rainwater harvesting infrastructures, except for home and, age, and cistern age. Sampling season was most significant, indicating that seasonal differences between winter and monsoon, right, which could be attributed to increased storm and dust activity in the summer, which would influence that atmospheric deposition on the rooftop, could then influence uh, rainwater harvesting uh, rainwater har harvested rainwater concentration. Like for example, arsenic in the first part of each sampling season had a higher concentration than the last. And then arsenic and lead, the monsoon concentrations were um, higher than winter. And lastly, we for the Globe Miami area, there is a relationship between distance and location from the mine and arsenic or lead concentrations in the rainwater. All right, that I just went through uh, we are at 11.32, and I probably went through the, a data set that was most interesting to this community due to the community characteristics. Um, I now um, can go into microbial, and then I can end with the organic compounds. And so these I'll go through, I'll probably need about a full eight minutes, Chris, so maybe just 20 minutes for questions. So big shout out to AJ Moses, who just graduated with their PhD in environmental science and a minor in law. AJ is now, was now hired as a soil conservationist and is uh, now based in uh, Phoenix. And we are with the um, US Department of Agriculture's National Resource uh, NRSC. Someone probably will remember, know exactly that acronym on the call, but we're very proud of AJ. Um, and here also acknowledging all the team members of the microbial, uh, uh, microbial team. All right, what are we gonna talk about today? Microbano, I have some of these are in Spanish and English, but the majority will be in English, uh, bear with me. We're gonna look at total coliform. So this is a group of mostly harmless bacteria that can serve as an indicator species for poo-poo contamination, um, essentially uh, feces contamination, the presence of a more potentially more harmful microbe, and they're highly concentrated, concentrated in the poop and intestines of warm and cold-blooded animals. So we expect to see this um, in our environment due to, um, you know, because of animals pooping in the environment, right? Uh, e. coli is a bacteria naturally found in the poop of warm and cold-blooded animals, including humans. Um, it's detected commonly because animals have been defecating in the environment for centuries 
And most types of E. coli are har harmless, but they could be associated with foodborne illness. And so we've seen in the past years where E. coli exposure has led to foodborne illness um, in different parts of the world. But uh, so that's just an introduction to what we'll be talking about in the next two to three slides. What you'll see here is I'll be saying the percent of detection, which will just be a percentage, or you'll see most probable number. And this MPN is a method used to estimate the concentration of a viable microorganism in a sample. All right, so one of the things AJ did that um, under our guidance was to tease out and look at was there any differences between these urban and rural communities, right? Thinking about that these communities might be different, there might be different amount of animal populations, wild and domestic, um, farming, etc. And so what you see here is the rural, all three rural communities, Dewey, Humboldt, Hayden, Winkleman, and Globe, Miami, grouped together and compared to Tucson are, sing are only our solely urban community. And what you see here is that there aren't, uh, and then you see the total represented in brown here. And what we see here is there aren't any major differences in total coliform concentration. However, when we look at E. coli, we actually see that E. coli is less than what we, uh, the Tucson community. But now if we start to bring in the rest of the communities, you can see here, uh, Dewey Humboldt represented, but let's look at Globe Miami represented here in this green, that we don't necessarily see any major differences of the most probable number per 100 milliliters of the total coliform in the harvested rainwater by uh, community. However, it is interesting to look at the differences in E. coli. And what we see here is Hayden Winkleman and Glow Miami are slightly greater than, or greater than, excuse me, Dewey Humboldt here. Now, this is the only slide I'll have on soils. So granted that we did monitor soils and plants and you can go to our website to see more information on that. But I wanna highlight the presence of E. coli and salmonella in garden soils that were ir not irrigated with harvested rainwater and irrigated with harvested rainwater. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time here. Notice that this measurement will be reported in the percent of positive samples, right? So this is just whether it's a plus or a minus, it's either there or not. This is not a measurement of actual concentration. This is just presence. And what we see here um, is that this is looking at the soils that were irrigated by harvested rainwater. We again doing the same thing. We're comparing the total um, mean value to the urban, which is Tucson, rural, which is all three communities together in purple, and then each individual rural community here. And so we see actually that Tucson and Dewey Humboldt had the uh, had over 70% positive detection of E. coli in samples irrigated with rainwater. However, when you look at E. coli uh, concentrations in non-irrigated soils, we see that Dewey Humboldt's at almost 90% of positive samples. Uh, and, and compared to Globe Winkleman, or excuse me, Globe Miami area, that's just slightly above 40%. And so this stood out to us um, and is interesting that we're not seeing, if you just compare uh, your community, Globe Miami, and granted there's only 48 samples in this data set, your community uh, was irrigated with harvested rainwater, not irrigated with harvested rainwater, irrigated is just above 50%, non-irrigated is just above 40%. If we look at salmonella, uh, we see that this is approaching 50% for irrigated and below 40% for non-irrigated. And so in summary, we saw fecal indicators, right? Total coliform and E. coli are present in both garden soils and harvested rainwater. But fecal indicators are more common in soils than the rainwater itself. We did see an association between animal presence with total coliforms and E. coli. We do wanna highlight that since we detected these fecal indicators, right? Total coliform and E. coli in the harvested rainwater, we do know that participants are, um, so this was a really cool thing that AJ did. So in this, after we did our first survey, AJ was like, well, if we're worried about the microbial, uh, microbial contaminants um, on the surface of plants, we should see how uh, people are irrigating the crops in the garden. And so one of the things, so AJ modified the survey and added this question to see how people were watering. And so since most people are uh, using it to irrigate crops, and 60% stated that they do a top-down watering approach, 
we actually recommend now based on this data set since we did see fecal indicators that participants and families irrigate their gardens at the base, at the soil level, not from above. So that harvested rainwater does not touch the surfaces of the plants that are being irrigated that just goes straight into the ground. And I can explain that later, uh, further detail later if necessary. E. coli presence and absence in harvested rainwater was not associated with E. coli presence in the soil. But we did, uh, and so that was an interesting, um, these are just some highlights from that data set. As you saw, this was a whole dissertation. So there's a lot of uh, additional details that went into this work that we could follow up on. All right, and to conclude, I'll conclude with the organic compounds or pesticides and industrial compounds. Uh, big shout out to Norma Villa Gomez Marquez, who just graduated with her PhD in environmental science, and shout out to the research team that worked on the organic uh, analyses. All right, so we're in, so buckle up for this one, right? Because this, this uh, we have this group. So for the metals, I just talked about arsenic and lead, but some, Norma has made some cool figures that combine all these compounds at this point in time. And so I'll show all of those. But just to give you a sense, we, we're gonna look at uh, herbis, uh, pesticides. So one, two, three, four, five pesticides, uh, six pesticides, or sorry, six pesticides, excuse me. And then one, two, three, four, five, five industrial compounds. And so I'll uh, be sprinkling in some details about these, but in general, atrazine, promethon, carbile, and chlorpyrifos, which I can't pronounce very, and pentachlorophenol, as well as simazine, are pesticides. And then these fluorinated, uh, floral surfactants or fluorinated compounds are global persi are persistent in, persistent across the globe. We're finding them um, in ice and uh, water sources and other rainwater um, across the world. So stay tuned. And yeah, Chris Jones, you can cut me off at any point, but I'll just, I think I have about four more slides on this. Um, you know, the measurements are different here will be nanograms, right? So nanograms are gonna be one droplet of ink in 12 million gallons, which is equivalent to 18 Olympic size swimming pools. So we're talking very small uh, measurements here, parts per trillion. All right, here we go. So let's uh, orient ourselves to these graphs or these figures. This is gonna, across the board, I'm gonna show you mean concentrations with the standard deviation across all years of the project, sorry, this is 2020, in nanograms per liter. What you'll notice is this number above each bar. The number above each bar indicates the number of detection, right? This is just if it was detected in the sample out of the 595 roof harvested rainwater samples we received for organic compound analysis. So just remember that number is just the number of detections across the project. Then what you'll see is the bar is gonna represent the mean concentration. And then if it, it has the lines on it, it's an industrial compound. You can see that Norma has grouped the industrial compounds to the right side of the graph. In general, right, most compounds had a mean concentration at or below 50 nanograms per liter, right? So we can see here the majority are around here, except for simazine, right, a, um, a pesticide, and these perfluorinated compounds, which were closer to 100 nanograms per liter. But really, the nanophenol had the highest mean concentration above 250 nanograms per liter. And so we want to highlight that this had the highest concentration and that this is a surfactant, right, that's widely in use in the industrial um, areas, but it can also be used as an inner, inert or non-active ingredient in pesticide sprays and can travel long distances from the point of application. And then most frequently detected, again, going to this number, um, we see that it's, um, in addition, we see uh, Prometon at 215 out of the 595, followed by nonophenol, pentachloral right here at 191, and PFOS, right? So this is just looking at the numbers of the frequency of detection, not concentration. This might be uh, more interesting to you, and apologies, this is supposed to be 2020, um, is here we're looking at by the concentrations, the mean concentration of these compounds by community. So uh, stay with me here. Again, the number above each bar indicates the number of detections out of the total. And so one thing here is we see that for the Globe Miami area, 
we see this value being greater than the other communities, only detected 336 times out of the whole uh, project duration, but having the higher mean concentration. This is a fungicide that's widely used to treat uh, utility poles and railroad ties. So that was interesting uh, to learn about. In addition, we see that Promaton, we see that the, in general, uh, Globe Miami is a, a little, about approaching 100, one of the great, had the greater mean concentrations when compared to the other communities. And this is an herbicide that can be applied to bare ground around buildings and on fences, but it's also used in combination with asphalt or applied in or below roads or parking lots before construction. And so you could imagine that when these uh, prom uh, promethon is being applied, it could impact harvesting, rain, harvest, harvesting rainwater systems that are near roads and parking lots. If we then look at this suite of industrial compounds, what's interesting is that greater mean concentrations of industrial compounds in general, right? So we're seeing that these are greater across all communities. In general, concentrations uh, were greater overall. So here I was just highlighting the industrial. In general, concentrations were greater in Tucson followed by these communities. Um, and so that's what's just giving a snapshot of looking at these. One thing that's interesting is SDNS here uh, in the Globe Miami area, which um, I can talk about in a little bit more detail. Uh, this is again, I think for the sake of time, I might just, uh, actually I'll finish on this slide, is this is again looking at the rural versus urban. So this is no longer by community, just dividing rural by urban, and again, dividing out the data by pesticide industrial compounds. When you see bold, that means that there was a statistical significant difference between the rural and urban. And so in general, nonophenol concentrations were greater in Tucson, and so was the frequency of occurrence. And concentrations were greater in rural locations for these herbicides, but the frequency of occurrence was, was higher in Tucson at lesser concentrations. So we're constantly going between these mean concentrations observed then looking at the frequency of occurrence, did we detect it or not? And so that's something we're going back and forth with with this data set that uh, require this might require a little bit more time to interpret. But we do want to acknowledge that these herbicides were had greater concentrations in the rural communities. However, right concentration wise, the frequency was higher in Tucson, but at a lesser concentration. And so to wrap up this section, right, we did see that pesticide concentrations are greater in rural concentrations, or rural locations. These pesticides were greater during the monsoon season. And that we do know from a previous colleague in public health that greatest of the pesticide applications are expected to be greatest in August when insects and pests are most numerous. When we talk about the industrial compounds, we'd like to highlight that nonophenol concentrations were significantly lower in monsoon, which was not the trend we saw across contaminants. Uh, and then I just want to highlight that that PFBNS that we saw was uh, had a, a higher mean concentration in the Globe Miami area is like this compound or excuse, yeah, this um, perfluorinated compound and surfactant is an industrial surfactant, and it's also used in these other types of material and ultimately can resist heat, grease, water, and oil. And we saw that mean concentrations were greater in the rural, uh, rural communities, greatest in Globe Miami, but the frequency of occurrence, right? Again, the number of detections was higher in Tucson, but had a lower concentration. And lastly, if we look at um, the standards associated with these compounds, I'm just going to highlight uh, a few. And the reason why I'm highlighting these perfluorinated compounds is because, number one, these are up and coming in terms of regulatory, uh, further regulatory scrutiny due to their ubiquitous nature across the world being found in different environmental media. And one of the things is that we have this lifetime health advisory. This is a risk-based, non-enforceable drinking water standard. So this is a drinking water standard. Just make sure that you keep that in mind. And we did see across all communities, there were 57 exceedances um, in this value for drinking water. Uh, but please note that it's the combination. It's when the value is when you combine these two compounds together. So either this compound alone could exceed 70, or it could be the combination of PFOA and PFOS exceeding um, 
the value of 70 nanograms per liter. In addition to, we see carbile, which is a, um, a pesticide. We saw that the, uh, there is a standard of zero for surface water partial body, uh, partial body exposure. And we saw 122 exceedances of this value. Again, the standard zero. So we saw 122 above that across all communities. Oops, okay. So this is uh, what we just did today is one form of information dissemination efforts. What I wanna highlight is that we've been doing a, a intense data sharing across all communities in different ways. So between 2018 and 2021, we've hosted five uh, art infused ripple effect uh, data sharing events in English and five in Spanish. Uh, same time period, we've done five booklet only sharing events. So this is where we're trying to tease out the differences in learning and recall and emotion based on data sharing practice. So we've done five uh, booklet only English, five booklet only Spanish. We've built an interactive bilingual website, an interactive bilingual map. We have built a, we're almost done with our database so that anybody can pull the de-identified data and use it for any other types of analysis. And we've followed rigorous data management practices to maintain the privacy of all participants while um, understanding the harvested rainwater quality. And then I'll just end with these different types of meetings uh, we've been presenting to our external advisory board meeting and internal advisory board for the project. Uh, quarterly updates have been given over throughout the course of the project to the Dewey Humboldt Community Environmental Board. We've also been presenting at the Hayden Winkleman Alternative Superfund site multi-organizational calls. And thank you to Chris Jones for having us. And we've been presenting uh, through the extension presentation series. So this is me like the last minute trying to make this like summary slide. And what I just want to say is that we have a lot of data, okay, a ton of data. And so what I showed you is just a snapshot. One thing that we saw across con uh, contaminants, uh, or, you know, and this is in general, right, I'm summarizing, there's like obviously idiosyncrasies with each chemical and compound, is that we saw that sampling season, right, so, uh, and community characteristics influence contaminant concentrations. And these are the two major variables uh, that are influencing uh, the concentrations that we see across time with really in general monsoons having, first monsoon being greater. But again, we're teasing that out and this is a general broad statement. And please stay tuned that we're working on other ways to, summar, uh, to summarize a summary of results and other ways to do broad dissemination of this data. Thank you all so very much and happy to answer questions with the last eight minutes today. Sorry, Chris. No, thank you so much, Monica. I think we really enjoyed that. I really appreciate it. And just to let the audience know, and Monica, we are going to be taking your questions on the Q&A and the chat. We already have a few in there. Um, I will stop the recording around noon. I'll kind of close it down. But as long as you're willing to have, as long as Monica and Miriam are willing to stick around with us, we're going to answer your questions. And um, and that's what we're going to do. So before we jump into that, I want to make sure, let me hit send here, that you look into your chat box. Well, I said welcome, but you know, thanks for participating in the webinar. I have a brief evaluation. It's just a few questions. It'll take you probably a minute and two if you have anything to type. So just go open that little form for me, and that just helps me out with this, and you can Give me any type of feedback there as well. Um, Monica, one question I have, uh, when is this, the interactive map, the results map going to be available publicly? Because I went to that website and you still need to log in to get into, to, to observe it. Yeah, so great question, Chris. What we're trying to do is time that opening of, so one thing that everyone should know is that we, prior, we followed a community first reporting model. And that community first reporting model means that the data set goes through internal review by the research team and then is released as uh, swiftly as possible to participants of the project. And so participants of the project have been receiving their data set at the end of every year and have access to everything. We have not, um, so the goal is to, tie, is to do, follow good communications and pre PR. And so we're trying to tie a press release coming from the Sonoran Environmental Research Institute and the University of Arizona with the release of this data set. So I would say we're hoping that that'll happen in the coming months. Okay. Because correct. we want it to accompany the summary of results because we really feel strongly that it's important to have this nice summary 
that someone can review while going through the nitty gritty of the map, which I'm happy to show today if you'd like. And, and when that's ready, please um, share that with me. I'll share it with my garden and country uh, uh, listserv, and that way I can get it out to people who are interested. So with that, let me jump into a, the Q&A here. And one attendee asks, in the presence of E. coli and salmonella in garden soil, measurements non-irrigated by rainwater, how was that soil watered? Good question. So that probably uh, non-irrigated would just receive water that did not come from a cistern that went through a harvesting rainwater infrastructure. And so that's what that means. That's how it was probably receiving water. And so what that, what that data set tells us is that we have naturally occurring these, um, these indicator organisms or these, um, excuse me, these microorganisms are naturally occurring in soil, right? And that it's not just from the harvesting rainwater system that would impact their concentration in soil. And yeah, so in my experience, that place where we got the non-irrigated water several yards, you know, the other side of the yard that does not get that rainwater. So another question is, is there differentiation between other irrigation methods in the non-irrigated water data? Is there other, um, wait, sorry. So over in the Q&A, if you want to open that. Yeah, my chat's a little different in the questions, actually. Um, uh, let me, in the, well, so, so just repeat it. So you're saying yeah. that- um, Is there differentiation between other irrigation methods in that non-irrigated irrigated data? data? Um, um, the way I will explain it is that we wanted the participants to water the irrigated soil with the collected rainwater from their water harvesting objects. So whether they did it with uh, a hose or any other way. And the non-irrigated soils were not, they basically were not irrigated with the same source of water. So, so it was something and we don't, yeah, we don't make, have that data. Yeah. And we don't, yeah, what, maybe what, they didn't yeah. grow anything there or they were growing something with their own wiring system. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And um, another question from, from Mark he asks, How does how much influence does dust have on contamination? Is the first flush of rain more contaminated than succeeding flows? That's a really good question. I think that one thing that we did notice, and I think I highlighted this one in terms of the arsenic and lead data, is that, you know, Kunal was able to show that arsenic, the first part of each sampling season, had higher concentrations than the last when we talk about arsenic. And then arsenic and lead concentrations were higher in monsoon than winter. And so um, this idea, and I see there was another question about um whether like you know i think what we were we're anticipating is that you have in monsoon you'll have like these high winds or right before monsoons you'll have this dry dry event then you'll have these high winds and you'll get that atmospheric deposition of per uh, particles on the rooftop that will then get washed into uh the or the, whatever uh, settles on the rooftop will then get washed into the cistern i did want to say one thing so someone says typically think about rainwater harvesting contaminants coming from roof tiles. I was surprised to see the study was, so I would like to highlight that it was, do we have all the roofing material as part of the study? So we looked at roofing material and that contribution to rainwater. And as, as I showed for the arsenic and lead data, we did not see um, what your roof was made of as being a major contributor to any of the concentrations in arsenic and lead. However, Norma did tease out some of the um, look at roof type material and how that might have influenced some of the compounds, but I don't have that data offhand, um, but we would happy to follow up with you at any time, Molly, if you'd like to see that. Very good. Uh, another question from Jen. Would you recommend that capturing rain, rainwater is best done at the end of the monsoon season and at the end of winter precipitation? maybe flush out the water captured in earlier days? 
it's I, I get I hesitate to make like broad uh, recommendations at this point in time as we still are working through the full you know data set as you see we had almost 600 samples across like across like 33 different uh, contaminants and so to make I would say that in general because we saw um, monsoon for arsenic and lead greater um, than winter and then we saw for arsenic it was greater in the first sampling season than the others that in I you know it is interesting to think about um, when to capture and maybe the first flush or maybe you know a running could be helpful in terms of, the, of what we're seeing right now. Right. But I'm hesitant and, to make one broad recommendation at this point. And something I'd like to bring back that you pointed out is that you had very few, if any, exceedances of standard for its intended use. You know, if we're using it for irrigating, when did that ever get, ever be exceeded? And so some people may be asking these questions as if they want to use it for drinking water and they mm -hmm. need to be, they need to be um, treating that if they're going to do so. Yeah, so I would say across the board, irregardless of this study, if you want to, just as we, the one really good comment that came out from my colleague was, is do, do you anticipate harvest in rainwater, like when we talk about should it be regulated, should it have standards, and they're like, but maybe it's just going to be treated like private well water is, where it's like the, it's the consumer and the household's responsibility to do the yearly or, you know, the year, at least minimum yearly testing of that water source to determine its utility and quality, right? So I recommend this across the board. If you have a private well, you better be testing at a minimum yearly for contaminants that were talked about, specifically arsenic, lead, um, and total coliform and E. coli. There are others that are, should be added to that list, but um, and we could, that's a whole nother conversation, but we can treat harvest. If you're going to be drinking your harvested rainwater, you need to be testing it. And then you might need to, you know, employ and have some type of filtration system to mitigate and reduce the chemical concentrations, right? Because of, for human exposure or that direct ingestion. So for example, with the total coliform and E. coli, we saw values above, you know, above the drinking water standard for those, right? I didn't show that table, but we did see. And so that, that does tell us that we need to have additional precautions uh, and like some type of treatment of the water before in drinking. Okay. And so at this time, I'm just going to show the, the closing slide to stop the recording. Everybody who's present, please stick around. We're not, as long as Monica's with us, we're answering the questions. Okay, so let me just get that taken care of because we I want to close this down for the recording. All right, here are our presenters. And we are, are doing our question and answer discussion with Monica and Miriam. Thank you very much. And just want to let people know we'll be back next week on Thursday with Bill Cook from our Greenlee Cooperative Extension Office. Mm -hmm. He's a horticulture extension program coordinator. We'll be talking about vertebrate pests in the garden. So gophers. And so thank you very much. Everybody have a good day. We'll see you next week.